believe that shout hallelujah. Y'all <laughs> clap. We want to welcome everybody that's visiting with us today by Facebook. We are believing for you to receive a fresh word from the throne of God. Let us all bow our heads and go before him in prayer. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for this, another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask you to shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. Help us to see it. Help us to get it. Your word for us in the name of Jesus. We pray that my speech and my preaching will not be with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but let it be the demonstration of your spirit and of power. That our faith not rest in the wisdom of a man, but in the power of God. We're open to the operation of the gifts of the spirit that you desire to flow or function that way in our midst. And as always, we covenant to give you and you only all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In the miracle working name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Open with me in your Bible, if you would, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I want to look at verse number 9. I'll be looking at this out of the New Living Translation. We're actually concluding today a brand new series that we've been on for 20 weeks called Accessing Grace by Faith. We have a final part to get to as we end it with a bang. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Verse number nine, we find what I believe is the, the heartbeat of God's message to us today. Verse number nine, it says this. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, by his poverty, he could make you rich. I want to finish this series with a message that I like to call Accessing the Grace of Prosperity. There's no way that I could take the time to recap 20 weeks worth of messages. But I do challenge you, if any part of this message is of an interest to you, you owe it to go back and get the whole picture. But what I can say is this. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 2 that we have access into this grace in which we stand. We have access into that grace by faith. Faith gives us access to the grace of God. Over and over and again, they would speak grace to the people in the New Testament. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Well, it could be a spiritual word. I mean, people pray for their food and they literally say grace. But the word has a significant meaning. The word grace, when you look at it in the New Testament, it means an unmerited favor. When you look at it in the light of justice and mercy, grace is when somebody gives you what you don't deserve. And essentially what we've learned is that there are things that God has given us that we don't deserve. We've looked at five different things, or this is the fifth thing. Peter calls the grace of God manifold. And so we've looked at the grace of salvation. We've looked at the grace of healing. We've looked at the grace of deliverance. And even last week, we covered the grace of preservation. One of the things that God has given you, which means you have it already, is prosperity. But if we were to look at our personal financial situation right now, many of us would ask the question, well, where is it at? Because we're not in the best of condition financially. I would imagine that the number one need or, or the number one uh, problem in, in human life would be financial. In my years as a pastor, in, in the time that I've seen in churches, I believe it could be categorically specific that the number one prayer request that comes into this church, all churches, is going to be about money. Amen. We look at where the most of us are, it's right in this place. And I believe the reason why money is a big problem for most people is because that's where the devil fights us the most. Amen. You know, we get our healing, we get our deliverance, and, you know, we're in a good place where we're not losing 
But he doesn't want to see where you have more than you need for yourself knowing that you would give to help other people. Amen. If I were to ask the question, how many of you would give to help others if you had more for yourself? If you could, in your own power, without it hurting you, pay off somebody's car or buy them a car. Pay off somebody's house. Or buy I believe that because of the love of God that is shed abroad in every believer's heart, we would do more if we had more. Amen. He knowing that, Satan knowing that, keeps us in a place of resistance constantly where our finances are concerned. And I believe the heart of this message is to show you from the word of God how to access the grace of prosperity, how to get access to what he has already given you. So let's look back at our text and make sure we have a good understanding of where we're going. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 9, he starts out by saying, you know. Now, you know, if somebody was in a conversation with you and said, you know that thing I told you the other day, or you know about this already, the assumption is, or the expectation is, this that I'm about to say is something that you are already intimately acquainted with. But for most of us, we don't know this verse. It might be for some of us the first time that we're ever hearing it. And so I want you to, I want to challenge you through this message, come to know what he's saying in this verse. He says, you know the generous grace. Again, you have to, you have to translate that. Grace is when somebody gives you something that you didn't earn, you didn't deserve, you didn't merit it, yeah. but they just did it anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in other words, Jesus gave you something that you couldn't earn or buy or deserve. Yeah. And he says, you, you know that. And then he explains it. He says that though he was rich. Now, I got to pause because... When you think about heaven, it's the richest place in the universe. Yes. Amen. I mean, here we pave our streets with asphalt or concrete. There, they pave the ground with what we base our money on. Amen. Wow. He says that though Jesus was rich, let me ask you, how rich do you think he was in heaven before he came to earth? Oh my gosh. Right? But yet it says that though he was rich, yet for your sake... He became poor. So literally, Jesus gave up all of heaven's splendor and glory and prosperity yes. and was born, think of it, of all places in a manger. Yes. How poor is that? Yes. You couldn't even be born on a bed. You were put in a feeding trough where the animals were eaten out of. Think about the, what he gave up and where he ended up in the lowest state of what you could say in a human condition. It says that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor. And he said he did it for my sake. Well, if, if he became poor and we're poor, then what benefit was that? Oh, y'all didn't get that. If he did it for us, then there ought to be. I mean, if you gave up something for me and we're both in the same condition, then you messed up. Right? I mean, you go, why'd you give all that up? But if you keep reading, he, though he was rich, he gave up all of that and became poor so that by his poverty, he could make you rich. Yeah. In other words, he saw that if he took on our poverty, mm -hmm. that we could take on his prosperity. Yeah. Yeah. I want to show you that line upon line that he did it. He gave up wealth, became poor, and then he made us rich in that transaction. <clears throat> in Luke chapter 4, Jesus had an opportunity to speak to a group of people. It was in a synagogue. And he found a specific place. When he spoke, he said, this is about me. He described to people what he was called to do and what he came for. The verse we just read said that he came to make us rich. Yeah. Look at verse 18 of Luke chapter 4. In Luke 4, 18, it says this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the, uh, liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind and to set at liberty those that are oppressed. So notice Jesus is describing what he is anointed to do. Amen. We know that from the time that he was uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, baptized, the Holy Spirit came on him and anointed him to preach and to do these things. Well, he said specifically, the number one thing that I am anointed to do is to preach the gospel to poor people. Yeah, amen. That fits the number one problem that people have. It fits and fixes the money problem. So notice, Jesus is anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Well, what is the gospel? The gospel literally is a fancy word. It just simply means good news. The gospel is good news. And, you know, and when you talk about, well, what then could be good news to a poor person? Well, one person said that you don't have to be poor no more. And that would be the, at least the beginning of good news to a poor person, that you don't have to be poor anymore. But to me, what is good news to a poor person is that you have won the lottery. Amen. <laughs> Somebody's like, yeah, okay, that's me. Amen. But in reality, that is good news to a poor person. Not that you can be or that you don't have to live like this anymore, but good news to a poor person is when you come to them and say, hey, somebody died and they left you an inheritance. And all you've got to do, I mean, they are, they are the wealthiest person that has ever lived, and they left this inheritance for you. All you've got to do is take this information, and you'll be able to access the accounts that have been set up on your behalf. In reality, that is the message of this entire series. Jesus died and gave you certain things that God prearranged and prepared ahead of time a life that he made ready for you to live. And all you have to do is take this information and access what's already Amen. yours. Amen. The big deal about that is the way we access it is by faith. You first have to believe that the accounts already exist before you go to the bank and put in the code. Come on, you already have to believe that things have been set up, laid up, and set aside for you before you make the effort to receive them. Amen. Amen. If, if that poor person hearing that good news, that somebody has left them this well, oh, I don't believe it. I didn't have an uncle. I don't know what you're <laughs> Oh, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. You're just trying to get my money. And so even though this great wealth is in store for them, the reality is they won't access it because they won't do what's necessary. Amen? Amen. And in the same sense, I believe so many of us are going to get to heaven and find out what life we could have lived. Yeah. We're going to see, as it were, they say, yeah, yeah. Uh, warehouses in heaven that were just set aside that we could have accessed. Yeah. Amen? But we're not going to do that because we're going to access it while we're here. Amen? Amen. So I want to show you from the word of God that God takes pleasure when his children prosper. Amen. In Psalm 35, 27, the Bible says, let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my wretched cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Amen. Not only are you and I sons and daughters of God, but we're also his servants. We serve the Lord. Well, the reality of it is this. We've got to know that it is God's good pleasure for us to experience prosperity. I mean, think of it. What father or mother would want their children to suffer? What would what, what father or mother, being wealthy beyond uh, no, you know, what's normal, would want their children to learn lessons by struggling and barely making it through life? In reality, our, our God is our Heavenly Father. And in reality, we ought not to live a broke and busted life. Yeah, if he's our father yeah. and he walks on streets of, yeah. with gold, come on. Yeah. If, the, if the silver and the gold belong to the Lord yeah. and the cattle on a thousand hills, if the earth is the Lord's, then surely he can help us live a better life. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I want you to know the Bible teaches it's God's good pleasure when you prosper. 
You know, a lot of times people don't believe that. They think that, you know, to each his own, and that's not my lot in life. And, you know, I just want enough for me and my wife, my son and his wife, us four and no more. Well, see, you strange. <laughs> you just want enough to, to have for yourself. But in reality, God wants you to prosper so that you can be a blessing Amen. even unto other people. Amen. 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 Another verse of scripture that describes the intimate heart of God is 3 John and verse 2. 3 John 2 says it this way. He says, Beloved, I wish or pray above all things. I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health even as your soul prospers. Yes. Well, some people, when they read the Bible and think about it, they, they think, well, God wants you to be prosperous in your relationships and healthy in your body and not have any problems. But it, he doesn't want you to be extravagantly rich. Right. No, you, you, you shouldn't own a Rolls Royce or have a Rolex watch. Or, what, what do you need two and three houses for? Oh, you know, I don't need a, uh, I don't need a house in, in the Hamptons or, or in Maui. That's just extravagant. Really? And there's some that, you know, they're like, yeah, really. You know, <laughs> there's some that actually believe that. But think about it. God, it's his pleasure. He says, I wish above everything that you prosper in all things and be in health. Is money an area of prosperity in life? Yeah. 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 And, and, and in, in every area of life, he desires for you to prosper. Praise God. If I could show you another, as we begin to look at, you know, well, how does he cause us to live this prosperous life? In Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 22, the Bible says that the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. That means God wants you to be rich and what he does is if you allow him, he will bless you or cause his blessing to be so heavy upon your life that his blessing on your life will make you rich. Somebody say, God bless me. Because according to the Bible, the Bible says that the blessing, what's going to make you rich? The blessing. The blessing of the Lord makes you rich. It'll cause prosperity Amen. to fill every void in your life. Amen. And on top of that, he's not going to add any sorrow with it. You know, in the world, they can the world can make you rich. Your boss can make you rich. You know, certain investors, they can make you rich, but with it's going to come a great toll on your life. Yeah. You won't be able to spend as much time with your family or your kids, or you may, it may cost you in other areas of your life. The Bible says, though, that when God blesses you, It'll make you rich, and he's not going to add any trouble that comes along with it. Amen. I want to show you the example of, of an individual in life who God blessed and what was the result in his life. In uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 12, we know this is the beginning of the story of Abram. The Bible says in verse 1 that now Abram, now the Lord has said to Abram, I want you to get out of your country. I want you to get away from your family and from your father's house, and I want to take you to a land that I'm going to show you. He says in verse 2, and I'm going to make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you will all the families of the earth be what? Blessed. blessed. Now what we already know is that the blessing of the Lord is going to make you rich. Yeah. He's not going to add any trouble with it. Well, sure enough, verse 4 says that so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him and Abram was 75 years old. You can't even figure it. Well, I'm too old for this message. No. <laughs> well, I live on a fixed income. Well, unfix it. <laughs> you know, your job is not your source. Your God is your source. And he'll use your job as one channel of many channels to get to you things that you need. I mean, Abram was 75 years old when God spoke to him, and he was living at his father's house. <laughs> uh, that's like way too old to be living with mom and dad. But anyway, but you haven't been there. I mean, I as an adult, you know, I've lived with my mom and dad before. 
But notice he said, I want you to leave all of that stuff. Leave your family behind, leave where you live, and I'm gonna take and I want you to start over essentially from scratch. And it told, told what he took. He took his wife, took his nephew, and he went. So he basically started with nothing. In, in one chapter, I don't know how many years it was, I can look it up, but just one chapter later, the Bible says. Because the blessing of the Lord was on him, in verse 2 of chapter 13, the Bible says, and Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Amen. You know, we'll read our chapters, and as you read the rest of your chapter, you'll know that he went through certain things, and he Amen. came out, and when he came out of those difficult times, he was better than he was before. Amen. And I'm here to tell you, in your life, you might be dealing with some very difficult things financially right now. If you do it God's way and you heed to what we're teaching you, you'll come out better than you've ever been before. Yeah. But the way to get through those tough times is going to be by faith. Yeah. You've got to believe that yeah. God's got good in this lifestyle. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So he came out. He was very rich. Somebody said he was very rich. Yeah. I mean, not just rich. He was like Richie Rich. Yeah. Y'all remember Richie Rich? Yeah. I mean, he was very rich. It breaks it down. We're not talking about just rich in happiness. He was rich in livestock. That's right. He was rich in silver, and he was rich in gold. Yeah. Come on, he was rich where his work was concerned, yeah. where his bank accounts were concerned, where his investments were concerned. God made him rich by putting his blessing on his life. In the book of uh, Mark chapter 10, another example of individuals who followed and obeyed God. Matter of fact, in a, if you can help me here, I think it's Job chapter 36 and verse 11. In Job 36 and 11, the Bible teaches us that if they obey and serve him, they will spend their years in, their days in prosperity and their years in in pleasure. If they obey and serve him, they will spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. Let's talk about that for a moment. The Bible is teaching us that individuals who will obey God and serve God, this will be the result of their life. They will spend their days in what? Prosperity. And their years in what? Now, if you're moved by sight, then you'll say, oh, well, I don't believe it. Why? Because right now, I don't have prosperity. I've got poverty. Or I don't have more than enough. I just got just enough. Mm -hmm. But what the Bible says is true. And if you believe it and allow it to, to firmly persuade you and you accept it as true, it will cause the grace of God to manifest in your life. And you will experience what the Bible says is true. If you obey and serve him, you'll spend your days in what? prosperity and your years in pleasure. There was a time Jesus, uh, you know, people uh, say, well, the, well, money is the root of all evil. And they don't like this kind of teaching. Again, the enemy will put all kind of thoughts in your mind to get you to believe that what you have is enough as long as you can get to heaven. What I'm challenging you to believe is that God has a life of prosperity beyond what you can imagine that's already arranged for you. And I want to show you how to access that. In Mark chapter 10, there was a young man who was very rich. He came up to Jesus and he asked him a question. What, what can I do to, to, to have eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? He said, all right, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you'll have an inheritance in heaven, and come follow me. And the guy dropped his head because he was very rich. Come on, somebody, he was very rich. And he went away sad at that saying. Why? Because he had great possessions. Not just possessions. Yeah. He was very rich. Jesus turned around and he said to his disciples, he says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. And the Bible says that the disciples were astonished beyond measure. They were like, what? And the reason why is because they were independently wealthy. They owned businesses. Come on. They, they had wealth. They were in a good place, praise God. Amen. But then, he, because Jesus knew that they didn't understand what, what he was saying, 
he repeated it, but he added this point. He says, how hard is it for those who trust in riches for them to inherit the kingdom of God? At that moment, then Jesus, excuse me, Peter spoke up and he said in verse 28, Peter began to say to him, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus turned around and said to him, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers, sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundred times now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Now, I really want you to understand this passage of scripture. It's incredible. It's, it's awesome, I should say. It is believable. So they're trying to wrap their mind around this because they've given up everything. They did like Abraham did. Abraham left everything. He left his home. He left his place, lands that could have been promised to him. And he's following what God is saying. Job told us that if you obey and serve God, then you're going to end up in a good situation. Come on. And they gave everything. Right? They left their fishing business. They left their family. And now they're serving. I mean, Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I don't have a place to stay. Y'all come and follow me. <laughs> he was like, well, when you get a place, then I can come help you. <laughs> but they gave him. They're just going. And he tell them, don't take anything. And, you know, it's going to be provided for you. If you go into this city, don't worry about taking stuff. We don't trust that your job or your bank account, come on, has got you covered. Everywhere you go, go by faith. They were like, hold on, Jesus. We have done that. We have given up everything to follow you. And he, he brought this to their attention, and I want to bring it to yours. He says there is nobody who has given up anything for my sake and for the gospel who won't receive a hundred times as much that they gave up in this life and in the life to come, eternal life. Somebody say, well, you know, this prosperity is for the future, it's for when we get to heaven. No, God wants you to live it right now. And he's made it available, but it's up to you to believe it. What is a hundred times a hundred? Somebody said 10,000 when you were at the early service. Right. <laughs> you know, 100 times 10 is $1,000. You have $100 times 10, you got $1,000. But 100 times 100 is 10,000. He's saying you can't even fathom the capacity and the accessibility of what God has prepared for you when you follow him Man, and serve him. Child of God, there's a good life that he has for you. And I'm going to show you how to access it. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's, let's look at this as we get ready to close. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is writing to the church. And I'm speaking this to you. Just like God spoke to Abram, and Jesus dealt with the disciples, God is speaking to you and I today. In Ephesians 1 and 1, it says this. Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints, that's us, which are at Ephesus, faithful, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Anybody faithful in Christ? All right. He says, grace and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. One of the first things that you've got to acknowledge is that God has already blessed you with every spiritual blessing that you could possibly ever receive, but he did it in heavenly places. Say it out loud. Right now, I am blessed with every spiritual blessing in the Lord. So now notice, the blessing of the Lord does what? It makes rich, and it adds no sorrow. Well, if I read this particular verse correctly, the Bible is teaching me 
that I am already blessed with every spiritual blessing. In other words, I have the blessing of the Lord on me right now. That means I have everything I need in order to be a success in every area of life. All right. With that in mind, I want you to notice this. Well, you've got to be able to see that your prosperity is a finished work of God. In other words, there's nothing more that God needs to do about your money problem. Many of you may be in a situation right now where, you know, you're believing God just to be able to, to make ends meet and get through this holiday and, you know, hopefully make it to another year. But in reality, God's done everything he's going to do about the money problem. In other words, you could say that it's unscriptural to pray and ask God for money. I wanted it to get quiet with that. <laughs> it is unscriptural to pray and ask God for money because he's already given you everything that you need for life. Amen. Always gets quiet here. Yeah. Think about it. You may have a need to pray, you know, it's, it's the whatever day of the month and you know your car note is due and this, you know, this payment has to be made and you're short. You know, Father, I'm praying that, that you give to me $432.57 in order for me to pay this bill. And Father, I just thank you. You know what I love you. You know, God, you know I want to do right. And I'm just asking you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, help me now. Because you know, Lord, I know. You know, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Ain't no problem like a mother. Bring the best prayer out of you. <laughs> but the funny thing is, in other words, you're asking God to do something that he's already taken care of. Hebrews 4 and 3 says, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. In parts of this, this series, I've shown you God did. He set up a good life for you to live before your mom even met your dad. Come on. He, he, pre he planned and prepared things before you came out the womb. He had this good life prearranged and prepared ahead of time for you and for me. For something that he has already given us unless we don't believe yeah. that he has already done. Right. So now we gotta see, we gotta start seeing things from a different perspective. It'll actually change the way that you pray. Yeah. Instead of asking God for money, the Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Yeah. Come on, this is good. You gotta follow this along. If you don't know what to do about your money problem, don't pray for the money, pray for the come on, y'all are preaching me that. Pray for the wisdom of God. God, what do you want me to do about this situation? I know you already know what I have need of even before I ask you. I ask you to show me the way of escape that I know that you've already made. Oh, my goodness. I think we done walked into something that'll help us. The works are already done. We looked at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. The Bible told us that his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of our Lord and Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So he has given. That means this is past tense. You don't need to ask for, for something that he's already given you. He has given you everything that you'll ever need that pertains to this life. Amen. Does a mortgage pertain to, pertain to life? Yes. Does transportation pertain to life? Yes. Yeah. The, you know, all the things that you can think of, vacations and clothing and travel and retirement and investments and all of those things, they pertain to life. He's already done it. Right. Amen. 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 So how do you access it? I'm glad you asked. Number one, you've got to believe that God has already prospered you. First part of this was real hard because so many people are all over the place where their beliefs are concerning prospering. But once we get past that and really acknowledge that God wants us to prosper, you've got to believe that he has already done. Just like we taught about healing. You know, don't pray and ask God to heal you. You need wisdom, ask him for wisdom, but believe that you receive what he's already done for you. Amen. By his stripes, you were healed. Father, I believe that, even though the pain is still in my body. Yeah. 
I believe I'm healed. One day the doctor's going to tell me I don't need this anymore. And he's going to change the prescription. He's going to say that that's what's actually been wrong with me. I've been taking too much of this. <laughs> the second thing that you need in order to access grace by faith, this particular grace, you need to remember how faith works. That's what makes the first, the first part of this series hugely important. You've got to remember how faith works. Now, if I believe, that means I'm firmly persuaded that God has already done this, but i got to remember how does it work. Well, number one, we remember faith works by saying. So if I believe i got the money and the money will be there when it needs to be, then I'm not going to say, I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do about my rent. I don't know how we're going to eat. I don't, know how, I don't know how I'm going to pay for this. Pastor, I need you to pray for me because I need money. Because I don't know how. I, I mean, we can't afford that. And then you constantly tell you, no, we can't afford that. We can't afford that. And you know, the Bible says out of the abundance of the, mark, the heart, the mouth speak. You actually believe that you can't afford it. You don't believe that you're rich. You believe that you're broke. You're like, yeah, Pastor Stan, look at my, look at my bank account. I am broke. No, you've got to believe that he has prospered you. But notice he blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Where do you need them? In earthly places. So all you need is the access code of how to get them from here to there. And they will show up. I promise you. This really works. So you gotta, you got to let faith work by saying. That means you got to change what you're saying about money. you got to change what you're doing. One of the things we learned is that whatever he says to you, do it. Amen? And that means if he tells you, and in your mind, you were thinking, I was setting this aside for this reason, but if the Lord tells you, take no, take this and pay that off. Just like Jesus' mom told him, told those servants, whatever he says to you, do it in the same way, whatever he tells you. Maybe you were thinking to use this for that, but he says in your heart, no, use this and pay this off. What should you do? You should pay it off. Why? Yes. Because now it puts you in another situation that you didn't see coming. Come on. Faith goes not by what it sees, but by what it believes. And if you believe God got you, then you can obey him, even if he tells you like the rich young ruler to leave this for that and come do this. Mm. Faith works by saying, Faith works by doing. Faith works by patience. The Bible teaches us that he that hastens to be rich is going to run into some trouble. There are no get rich quick, quick schemes. Don't be out there talking about, I'm going to be a millionaire by the end of 2019. That's my spiritual goal. Hallelujah. Really? You're going to be a millionaire. How much you got right now? Well, actually, I'm believing for a job, Pastor. Oh, really? All right, well, how about this? Don't despise small beginnings. Though your beginning is really small, though your bank account is small right now, your latter end, the Bible says, will greatly increase. So again, you've got to remember how faith works. It's not an overnight thing. Faith works by patience. Be patient, and you'll know the answer comes. And then the last part of that is, you know, faith works by love. Faith works by believing that God loves you, and love will never leave you in a bad situation. And you might be in a really bad situation financially right now. Faith works by you believing that God loves you. He's not going to leave you like that. It won't be like this always. I know it's a struggle. I know it's hard. And as far as you can see, you don't know where your next meal is coming from. But don't fret. Don't faint. God will provide for you. Because he always has. Amen. He's going to show up. Praise God. And then the last part of that, there's two add-ons that I want to add to how to access the grace of prosperity. And I really want to get these two because if you apply everything I've taught, you already know those two. But two things that as it relates to prosperity specifically, number one or, or number three in this, you've got to be faithful. And number four, is you've got to be diligent. So before I let you go, which is just a few minutes from now, I want to give you some scriptures about you being faithful where prosperity is concerned and you being diligent where your prosperity is concerned. Amen? Why do you, why do you have these two add-ons in addition to how faith works? It's because of what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16. 
In Luke chapter 16 and verse number 10, he says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful in what is much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in what is much. If you're not being faithful with what you have right now, which is less than what he has already made available for you, if it were to manifest, you wouldn't be faithful. You know, if you're not taking care of the car that you have right now, you won't take care of that luxury car that you want or that sports car that you desire. No, you won't. Oh, yes, I would, Pastor. All right, take me down the street. Well, hold on. Let me move these styrofoam cups and let me move this trash bag out. Oh, Pastor, don't mind it. Just come on, get in, Pastor. What's going on? You, when was the last time you got the car wash? You know, I don't want to spend too much time there because most of us are not even in that place. But in, in reality, if you're not faithful with what you have right now, if you despise, I can't stand the clothes I have. I can't stand the, the car I drive. I don't like where I live. You know what? You're not ready for the next level. Why? Because he said be content with what you have right now so that you can boldly say the Lord is my helper. He will never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. So be faithful. He even goes beyond that. He says he, in verse 11, uh, if you'll help me, um, he that is unfaithful in that which is, uh, if you have not been faithful, uh, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? What I like about this is this. The word unrighteous mammon literally means money. Mammon is money. Money is mammon. He says, if you won't be faithful where money is concerned, who's going to give you real money? Y'all you know what I mean by real money. If you're not being faithful with, you know, your finances where they are right now, then you will not be faithful with the bigger finances. And then last, he says, if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, then who's going to give you something that you own right outright? And as long as you're making pay payments on it, you don't own it. Oh, I, I own my own car and I own my own house. All right, you're still making payments on it. We can find out who owns it. You stop paying. And the owner come pick it up. They don't own it. Until you finish, right? They're wrong with that. But until you finish, you're, co you're in a co-owning situation. But think about it. If you're not faithful to take care of something that belongs to somebody else, when it manifests, you won't. So that's why in order to access the grace of prosperity above doing it by faith, you also need to be faithful. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 28 and verse 20, I believe, it says that uh, a faithful man will abound in blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. What kind of man will abound with blessing? A faithful man. And when the blessing of the Lord is on your life, what does it do? It makes you rich. How many of y'all see this cycle? Amen. So you've got to be faithful. And the last thing I close with is be diligent. Be what? Diligent. diligent. Be faithful where your finances are concerned, but I also challenge you, be diligent where your finances are concerned. Proverbs 27 and 23 says, to be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. Now, we're not agricultural, but they were. This is true for us, even though it's not in an agricultural sense. Be diligent with your work and be diligent to attend to your job. Diligence is a huge factor in you being able to handle being rich, and I'll show you in a moment. But look, what do you mean? Be, be diligent to know the state of your finances. Do you know how much you spend unnecessarily? The world has a terminology, disposable income. You know, coffee here, fast food there, this and that. I don't have any disposable income. Every income I have is used. <laughs> Not disposable. But how well do you handle your finances? Do you live on a budget, in other words? Are you diligent to know the state 
of your finances. How's your retirement looking? Oh, it gets quiet. How, how, how's your college plan? How's your, how's your, you know, your, 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 your investment funds? Do you know the condition of your finances? You say, well, Pastor, I don't have much. I don't have that. But do you know what you do have? Come on. Be diligent to know that and to attend to it. Look over it. Go over it. Don't be loose with your money. What you'll find is that there are some things that you're doing that are not to your advantage. They're not expedient. The next verse that I want to look at is also in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 4, it says this. The soul of a lazy man, they're not diligent. They end up desiring and they have nothing. Amen. Some of us are at that place where we've done all of this and we have nothing to show for. Amen. But the soul of the diligent, what's going to happen to them? They shall be made rich. What's going to happen? Prosperity is going to manifest in their life because they're diligent to know the condition of their finances and they intend to make wise decisions Amen. with their money. I'm challenging you. Be diligent and you will be made rich. Amen. And then last but not least, we skipped ahead. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4, the Bible says, I'm sorry, I don't remember it. It says, uh, he who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent does what? Makes rich. Makes rich. Come on, let this sink in deep. We're done. But I want you to get this. There's two add-ons that you've got to have. Above faith, you've got to be faithful. Got to be diligent. Some of the things that I'm going to be ministering on in the upcoming year are going to be diligence as it relates to financial planning. We're going to learn how to fix the money thing. Yeah. I mean, we're going to just look at just just some structured things about saving money and investments for your children and how to budget some basic things. But I challenge you, you can start right now, especially as we're about to go into a new year and a new season. Sit down, take some time. You ought to know which which credit debt has the highest interest rate, and then plan to pay that off? Come on, somebody. Be diligent where your money is concerned. These are the four ways in which you can access the grace of prosperity. Did y'all get anything out of this? Oh, come on. Thank you all so much for listening in. And we pray that if you apply it, you will be blessed. Amen. Amen. Bow your heads.